So, um, hello everyone. I'd like to welcome you this evening or in New York this morning um, to this conversation. My name is Dr. Tanya Tzion Waldox from the Hebrew University, the School of Education. And we have with us uh, someone who for me is really um, an inspirational uh, leader uh, and a personal friend and mentor, um, and also on a global level in terms of worldwide impact, an educational leader and really a transformational thinker and, and doer. Um, and uh, Professor John Sexton, we could spend all the entire hour we have just reading your bio and all of your accolades. Um, I won't do that. I will just say that um, John uh, is a president emeritus of New York University, a dean emeritus of the New NYU Law School. Um, he joined the faculty in 1981, within seven years became the dean served as the Dean of the Law School for 14 years and then became the president of NYU at 2001 and served in that capacity until 2016. Um, and he's currently also the chair of the University of the People President's Council. So we'll be talking about things that you've learned throughout your career and also about this new project of the University of the People. Um, I will say before we get started with the various questions and thoughts that I have, um, and I'd love to ask you about, that um, we do know each other personally. Um, and I think that you're really a, a brilliant thinker and a wonderful storyteller and a visionary and an obstinate optimist. Um, but among other things that are your great qualities is your true romantic. And um, I can't start this uh, Zoom conversation without um, sharing for one moment um, this image of uh, Lisa, your your wife, your late wife, Lisa Goldberg, who was uh, a mentor for me and really someone who um, inspires me today, every day, still, even though she's already uh, passed um, now almost 15 years ago. Um, mm. And and one of the quotes that I have in my office at Hebrew University of hers is this quote. And when I went back to it today, I realized that your project that we'll talk about later today really is in many ways. Um, her vision come true. So I'll just read this and then we'll, we'll get into our uh, business. So, so Lisa said this, betting on people, especially talented young people, using technology and media to educate and to build new forms of community, ensuring equal access to high quality information for all citizens and protecting the rights while expanding the opportunities of the poor and disadvantaged women, ethnic and racial minorities. Above all, our goal is to be where others aren't, where we can bring our unique expertise and our passion to bear, where we can find partners to join us and leverage our own investment. Our hope always is that what we will do matters and will make a difference. So with that, with those words in mind and with Lisa in mind, um, I'd like you, John, to, and, and I already will say, I have several sort of questions and things I'd like to ask you about, and I would like to spend some time at the end uh, allowing the audience to, to ask some questions as well. But I'm also aware that uh, this is picking your brain and thinking together, and there's no real order here, so we can, we can go with the flow. Um, so one of the things that's really, uh, I think, always impressive about you is that you're very authentic and very enthusiastic, and you were known at NYU as the hugging president, right? There's not much difference between who you are in real life and who you are professionally, and I think that part of that is that education for you is not just a profession, it's not an academic endeavor, it's really a calling, right? And, and when I was sort of thinking and preparing um, and reading your book, which we will get to later, um, so uh, one of the things that you talk about is really this, this idea of being an educator as a calling. And, and I, I saw a quote of yours where you said, you were put on earth to be a teacher or a possibilitarian. So if you could explain this to us, and what does it mean to get your students to think strange? What's the role of debate and possibilities um, as, being, as being a teacher? Well, that's a big question, but uh, you've already said some things which require me to, uh, to go off on what it might appear to be an epicycle, but is all related to the big question you've just asked. Um, first of all, I am the president of the Tanya fan club. Uh, Tanya's dad and Lisa had worked together on projects. Uh, I could list them, some of them very important in Israel. Uh, one of them, for example, 
was the development of the Israeli and the Palestinian Sesame Street. So uh, it gives you a sense of the spirit of building bridges that was captured in that quote. And uh, they decided, and I agreed that Tanya would uh, come to the United States uh, and live with us for a year. And it was a wonderful year. And uh, she, of course, has said to me, I can't go into this, so I won't, except to say that one of her children is named for Lisa. Second, um, and we should put our cards on the table here. Uh, I sometimes facetiously say when I'm addressing Jewish groups that in me, they are confronting a historic figure. Uh, now, there's a great American baseball player named Jackie Robinson. His number was 42. It's the only number retired in all of baseball. And on April 15th, every year, every player in American baseball wears the number 42 because he broke the color line. He was the first black to play in the major leagues. And I sometimes say to Jewish groups that I am the Jackie Robinson of the B'nai B'rith Little League. I was the first goy to play. I broke the religion line uh, in Rockaway Beach. And I was the Shabbos goy for the twin Cantus who lived next door. Uh, as NYU was beginning to think about opening a campus, a major campus, 3 million square feet, uh, 27 buildings in Abu Dhabi. Lisa was still alive. This was 2005, 2006. Um, Lisa sent me to see Dan Gilliman, then the Israeli ambassador to the United Nations. Uh, and I met with him twice and he said to me, NYU must do this. He described it as important for the peace process and what ultimately became the Abraham Accords. Uh, it was an early seed. I'm very proud of it. Uh, after the second meeting in January, 2007, Lisa died. And uh, I saw the ambassador a third time to report to him. And when I got to him for a fourth time to report to me, he looked at me, he said, John, he said, I feel embarrassed. I, I didn't realize that you were Lisa Goldberg's husband. And the last time you were here, the third time after her death, I, I should have expressed my condolences. How are you doing? And I described to him how I was doing. And uh, he said to me, uh, you're not processing this like a Jew. And I said, well, Mr. Ambassador, there's a reason for that because I'm Catholic. And he said to me, I can't tell you how many people have given me lists of Jews in New York I must meet. You're always on the list <laughs> because I was the president of NYU. I speak a little Yiddish. I have a Brooklyn accent. I have a beard, you know, so whatever. So just to clear it up, Goyeshikov, that's me. Now, uh, education as a least, calling, possibilitarian. Yes, no, no, I know. And I was put on earth to be a teacher all during my 14 years as Dean and 14 years as president. One of the things I insisted upon with the trustees when I took those positions was I would continue to teach a full schedule. Because I said, I won't be able to understand why I'm doing what I'm doing as Dean or as president if I'm not continuing my vocation, which is to teach. And as you say, this word I made up to be a possibility. And in a way, I viewed being a dean and being a university president as putting a possibility, a story of possibility on the table for the institutions to see if people responded to it. So I, th I think that in, in education, especially higher education, that's what a dean or a president does. You're not, you're not a general. You're not, you don't own the operation. You're not entitled to give command and control orders, but you engage in evocative leadership. You put a story of what could be out and if the community accepts it and responds to it, then, then uh, it can be actuated. If, if they don't, then you listen to the sound of silence and you move on and you either tell another story that means something to you. Or... So this is, uh, th this is uh, the generic way that I view leadership in higher education. Now, uh, I was trained by the Jesuits, the Jesuit priests, that we were to live a life for others. That was their phrase for it. Uh, uh, and, and joy and fulfillment could only come if you could identify a useful life. 
And I was a reluctant dean and a reluctant president. The, the trustees of the law school and the university, four years it took them to persuade me to become president because I didn't see it as, as the best deployment of my talent. Not because of, I, my deployment would have been with my students in the classroom and having more time with them out of the classroom and doing more writing. Why would becoming president of NYU mean something? Well, this is where we get to Lisa because uh, I had been schooled, starting with that experience as a Shabbos Goy and growing up in the Vatican Council under the influence of uh, uh, Pope John the Twenty Third, uh, who uh, was the first to apologize to the Jewish people uh, and to say that no, we wa we welcome the wonder of the insights of Judaism. And the word ecumenism, ecumenical thinking, came into our theological thinking. So we got out of thinking that, uh, I mean, uh, I remember being taught that Jerry Epstein, my best friend and the son of the twin Cantus, could not go to heaven. I was taught that in Catholic schools in my early education. But of course, John the 23rd said, no, that's not the case. That's not the case. Uh, we, we must embrace the wisdom of all great religions. And so that ecumenical instinct was in me when I married Lisa. But 80% of what I am today was created by the love that we shared. And her spirit that's captured so beautifully in that quote, the odd thing about that quote is her name is on it. She wrote a book that sold 400,000 copies and her name wasn't even in a footnote. Sadaka, right? Anonymity was important to her. But her mission was building bridges of understanding and empowering those that have been marginalized. And the work that I've done since her death is very self-consciously. I mean, she's very, it's 15 years last month. She's very present in my life. And I view myself as representing both of us in the world. So she took that general notion of possibilitarianism and focused it on, first of all, in a grand scale, what we did at NYU, which is not to our topic for today, which was to create the world's first global network university, which you know has three main campuses, New York, Abu Dhabi, and Shanghai, and 12 other campuses around the world. And it treats the world as a metaphor for New York City, which was the, is the first city in the world that is a neighborhood for every country in the world populated by people that were born in that country. 40% of the citizens of New York City were born outside the United States. And you go to those neighborhoods and unlike most world cities, you go into little Turkey or you, 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 go, you go into uh, little Italy and those people will say, I'm a New Yorker. So there's the diversity and the wonder, like the elements of a watch. You know, you can still identify the elements, but it builds. So that's the grand ecumenical design for NYU. And then, of course, the University of People, which is our topic for today, is, 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 is not NYU. I mean, it, it, we don't pretend to be that. We pretend to be there for those that have no other opportunity other than the University of the People. And we try to create connections between the University of People and, for example, NYU Abu Dhabi, where after a student does a year at the University of the People and does well, NYU Abu Dhabi will look at him and give them ladders up. And, and not just NYU Abu Dhabi, but so Yale. Let me just pause here for a moment because I want to get to University of the People in a moment. Yeah. But before that, I feel like there's, um, there's also a cultural and political moment that we have to bring into this conversation in order to really understand why University of the People is so different, right? So the ecumenical vision as exciting and romantic and moving as it is, right? This idea- A secular, now, now a secular ecumenism. So the, the idea is that New York City is an ecumenical city, not in the sense John the 23rd used the word, but it's a secular version. And, and the theory, you call it romantic, I call it a life purpose, uh, but the, 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 the theory is that if we were able over the 60 years between the 50s and today, to do that theologically, then all the more we should be able to do it in a sec in the secular domain by creating bridges of understanding and connectivity where we celebrate difference rather than fear difference. Right, and that I think has to do also, and you mentioned this, this move from a dogmatic single truth, right? You're either with us or against us to 
pluralism, but that also requires some shared common basis, science, truth, seeking knowledge. And I think that if we put this in the current um, political climate, um, both in the United States and in Israel and actually around the world, and I think COVID has brought that home for everyone, right? It's not that knowledge is contested, it's that who knows and what we can know and who can know is contested. And um, you mentioned in, in another interview, this idea that people today have an allergy to nuance and complexity, right? That opinion and facts are interchangeable, that there's this reductionism and dogmatism. And, um, and I just wanna know how you, the problem I think is well known. So I don't know how much more we have to talk about the problem. I'm wondering how you analyze it. What is this about? Are people too lazy to think for themselves to really have debate? Is it about having too much data and information they can't make sense of it? Is it a lack of authority structures and lack of trust in institutions? Is it cynicism? I mean, wh where is this really coming from in your view? Well, well, first, I think it's important to just make explicit what you've implied in your question, which is the, the, the book which you, you, you waved uh, that I did uh, uh, about three years ago, and don't put it up because it, it, it's, it's too vague and when, it's not about the book, but it, it's called Standing for Reason. And it's an analysis of the role of the university in this present political co context. A and what I try to tell is it, this, the book's really a metaphor. I tell the story of theological ecumenism and how that's developed and how I could be in Abu Dhabi at, 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 at a conference that brought together 25 faith traditions uh, for the visit of the Pope and how the, the, the children of Abraham Square, which is being built with a temple, a mosque and a synagogue uh, and, and, and a Catholic church, uh, that that all could uh, 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 happen uh, in, in this time. The metaphor is perfect in that in the same way that Jerry Epstein and I back in the 1950s could not have a meaningful conversation about the virgin birth or the resurrection of Christ. I mean, it just, it, it was a deep truth in my life, but it, it was a truth that was revealed. It wasn't a, a truth to which I had reasoned. And I believed it because it came from the authority. Well, that's what's happening in our politics today. And the authorities are these uh, micro channels. I mean, you can listen to a whole bunch of things, but those are the maladies, right? And, and the, the case that I try to make in the book is that we have to put in play structural mechanisms. I use an analogy to debate and competitive debate in which I spend a lot of time, uh, but, but we, we have to begin to make more pervasive in society uh, conversations that go beyond talking points. And uh, uh, th there are different ways to do that. Yeah, I think competitive debate actually is a, is a vehicle that we can bring into our schools uh, just to train the minds of people uh, in what makes a champion debater. People don't realize this, but what makes a champion debater is that he or she is a really, 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 really good listener. Because if you don't listen to your opponent's argument, you're not gonna be able to answer it at the level that the judge in the back of the room will see you're missing if you don't listen to it. So, so I, I mean, the, the, my colleague at NYU, Carol Gilgan, talks about aggressive listening. So, but we have to build structures both into the, the, the education system and the culture. So one of the organizations that uh, I, I, I birthed, which is now well begun in the library system of New York City, is an association of senior debate which is competitive debate for senior citizens. So if you do it in the schools and you do it with the senior citizens and you be just, it, all we're doing is a process answer, but we've got to really attend to, to these processes. And, and that's, the, that's the antidote. And, and uh, in the conclusion of the book, as you know, which is titled Being Worthy of Lisa, I, I talk about how she would say to me, you know, uh, uh, with the same innuendo that you've used, my beloved Tanya. And let me drop a footnote here. I was the hugging president until 2006. And after 2006, and I could go into the story why, but it's not relevant today. Uh, I only hug students that ask, or faculty that ask for a hug. So I was way ahead of this consent stuff. In any case, back to text. Uh, Lisa said to me, you know, you are quixotic. 
you said dream it. She said, but if you stop tilting windmills, if we stop the good fight, if we don't try, we fail. It's a kind of version of Pascal's wager. So, so uh, I continue to tilt the windmills. And what's the role of, or, or how, how does the, um, this antidote and this, this form of constant learning and opening up our minds and really listening to the other and challenging ourselves and being reflective about what we know and sharing debate and diversity, how does that meet this vision and this issue of justice and inequality? Right, how, well, how, does those, how do those two come together? Right, so um, here I would connect into the thinking of someone like John Rawls which is where you try to develop an approach to the question of what is just by creating what he called a veil of ignorance behind which you sit, where you don't know where you're gonna be sitting at the table after the deal is struck, right? And you try to create the Pareto optimal. Now that can only happen through conversation in which, especially those who have been without power feel safe enough to make themselves vulnerable. And that's going on more than we think. There's a way to respond, for example. Now, here I am, a, a straight white 50s Catholic male. It's about as bad as it gets in terms of diversity, right? Uh, and when the students who have been marginalized, who come from marginalized backgrounds, say, you know, this is the way you hurt me. The conversation about structural racism, for example, or, or language or whatever. There's a tremendous act of faith that they're making in that moment. They're saying, they're weaponizing me. They're telling me what works to hurt them. Now, we've got to reciprocate. We, we can't hear that as saying, you know, John, you don't know it, but you have racist tendencies. And I all of a sudden become, you know, do you know my background? And do you know what I've done to empower you? You don't understand that I marched and did this and that, and whatever. You, you know, you're misjudging me. If we get defensive, it shuts conversation down. But if we say now, okay, let me, let me see it, 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 the uh, uh, ta Tanya? Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, I, just to show you how important I think this is, that was a call that sometimes comes in in the morning from my beloved daughter in California with my 10 month old grandson to do a Zoom chat with grandpa. But I, 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 I've stayed with you. So in, in, in any case, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the thought I was saying is, what Raimundo Panikkar, the great liberation theologian who was the mentor of Pope Francis, wrote 50 years ago was, if you want to get into this ecumenical conversation, I'm now using a secular metaphor here, you, ha you have to engage in dialogic dialogue, which is where you not only try to understand the other, but you try to put yourself in the place of the other and do two things. First of all, see the world that the other sees through that vantage point. But second, see yourself as that person sees you, the, the great poet, if we could only see ourselves as others see us. So where am I, even as the person I am, who feels I've lived a moral life and an ecumenical life, how do I respond as an active, aggressive listener to this person who's being, and those are the conversations we have to nurture. And I believe there's power in doing that. Now, to link, because I want to get us to the University of the People, because that's what you told me you wanted to talk about. So the link is this. If you want to create an ecumenical world, you have to be hyper-inclusive. So if you not you you are not including people because they are in refugee camps or they're displaced people or in their remote areas or and, and, and they can't even get into the conversation and their voices can't be heard. 
then you're not going to have the ecumenical conversation we have. Now, look, the proof, there is powerful proof of proposition, and I'm not being uh, uh, biased about this at all. Go look. And it is called NYU Abu Dhabi, which has 2,000 students from 144 different countries. This is undergraduate students. It's a full research university. There are 500 doctoral students there. But 2,000 students, 144 countries, every sector of society, 20% of them never 50 miles from home before they get on the plane to come in with scouts out there finding them in the hills of Afghanistan and the Masimara and so forth. And, and they come together and they're roommates and they live on the campus and they engage in this. The largest contingent in the student body, 15%, one five. So the largest contingent is 15%. They're from the United States, only 10% from the region. So think of that as an ecumenical community and it has worked and it's worked at the highest level. I think they've had 16 Rhodes Scholars in the first seven graduating classes. So stop and think about that. And, and uh, so it, it, the University of the People is not that, it's not a research university. But it's a way to get into the conversation people who would never be able to get into the conversation, whether they be homeless or in favelas or in, in camps. Uh, the University of People is educating more refugees and displaced people than the rest of American higher education combined in an accredited American university. So stop and think about it. And, and then the idea is to create these partnerships, which I began to allude to earlier with places like NYU Abu Dhabi and Edinburgh and McGill and uh, Yale and Berkeley, uh, where they'll, at the end of the freshman year, allow these kids, who don't, if you're a refugee, by the way, you can't apply to Yale because you don't have a transcript. You don't have letters of recommendation, let alone an SAT score, right? But we're developing programs where after a year, you know, we'll say to various universities, how many students do you want from Rwanda? <laughs> you, you know, and, we'll, and we won't admit them, obviously, but we'll give you stars for Rwanda because unless you're really got problems of, of, of bigotry you have to accept the proposition that talent is distributed isomorphically and if you accept that proposition uh, and and you you start with the fact that 40 million 40 million children in the world won't meet a teacher for a single day in their entire lives and another 350 million, so that's getting close to 400 million, another 350 million uh, will, uh, uh, can't get past the fourth grade, even if they're as smart as Tanya and John. Now you get the ones that actually make it through all those obstacles and they finished high school and they're college ready, 125,000 college ready Syrian refugees in camps in Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan with no place to go. So think about that. Uh, or think of a homeless woman, real case, homeless woman in California, two years at University of People, transfers into Berkeley, now at MIT getting a PhD. So this is, if you really want an ecumenical world, you've got to make sure you're going into the nooks and crannies of the world to, to, to give that talent an, opp an opportunity. Right. So the, the project, and, and I know there are questions about how the project works, we'll, we'll open it up to questions soon. But what you're saying is that at, at heart, it's also a recognition that, um, that the people who do have access to privilege and power and knowledge must go out of their way to make sure that other people have that same access and... For their own benefit. Uh, at, right. And to their own benefit and that... Um, that you're also calling on, on again, I'm, I'm thinking about sort of certain movements in the left that consider themselves very woke and connected and cosmopolitan humanitarian, but use their criticism to disengage, to label, to not be self-reflexive. You're saying, no, bring yourself into the conversation. You will not only listen to others, you also learn to see yourselves differently, right? And so that's- yeah, it, 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 This is enriching of me. This is not me missionizing. This is enriching of me. This is a necessity for me to improve as an imperfect human being. And so that's the role of making this an American. This is part of the, the US role in the larger global vision of, of 
Well, it's a part of a possibilitarian's role. I don't see this as a U.S. role. I see, uh, I, 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 mean, I mean, the man who came up with this idea, Shai Reshaf, who's been my partner in uh, the University of People for 12 years, uh, has a heavy Israeli accent, you know? So uh, uh, I don't, uh, we are technically a California corporation and we're acc accredited as a United States university. Do you want me to explain to people a, a little bit about yeah, the Yeah, please do. Okay, but so, so um, first of all, we, we are essentially, we are made possible by an enormous cohort of thousands of volunteers. So I am a volunteer as the chair of the president's council. Shai is a volunteer has to, and, and I've devoted a part of my life for the last 12 years, more in the last six since I stepped down as president. Shai has de devoted his life to this for the last 12 years. Uh, and, and, and he's the one, you know, he says that we're partners, but he's the 90% partner. You, you know, and I'm probably a 2% partner. There's another person who's the chair of the formal board, a woman named Pascaline, who's, I'd say, an 8% partner. So, so, but in any case, uh, uh, we, we, we are run by volunteers. We have thousands of volunteer faculty. I've invited you to be one. Uh, and uh, we are completely online. We are small class instruction so model a class that has 24 students in the 24 time zones uh it is peer-to-peer -peer learning led by a volunteer professor so you don't have to the materials are all prepared for the uh, our courses are nine weeks long uh, many students take two courses per period so so uh, uh, uh and it's uh i think 40 courses for a bachelor's degree, 20 for an associate degree. We have some master's programs as well. So on, on Monday, I'm gonna use the American week. Um, on Monday, the readings, all open source materials, so no textbook course are posted and with questions and prompts. And students are required to do two things during the week. They're required to give, I'm going to make up a number, I'm not sure of the exact number, but four comments on the readings that everybody sees asynchronously and four comments on the comments of other students. So the conversation goes on for six days with the faculty member kind of watching it and correcting errors, redirecting it if it gets off track and so forth. And it goes around the world. And then on the seventh day, we don't rest. We give an assignment where you write a paper, short paper on the week's lesson, which is then given anonymously to two of your peers in the class who give comments on it back to you. And then repeat, repeat, repeat eight times the curriculum is developed. And, on, and then the ninth, uh, uh, week is a fairly rigorous individualized assessment uh, of each So student. even the pedagogy is building community around the world. Exactly. Right? It's not an individual neoliberal model. It's really everyone working together to learn from each other and to teach each other. And because of the technological issues, it's also allowing people, I assume, somewhere in a desert somewhere or, you know, you, not, you, not good access to electricity to be able to connect and get a real high level education. You, we, we've deliberately designed it not to require broadband. So you can do it even on a phone. Uh, and of course, that is one of the things that is becoming pervasive in the world and, and, and skipping. So uh, uh, how does the student body come to be? Well, uh, I saw somebody ask a question, no admissions requirements. So uh, we, we don't, we, we ask only high school graduates to apply, but it's an honor system uh, and students are required before they formally matriculate to take two foundations courses and they get three shots at each of the foundations courses to see if they're 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 comfortable in the way we because people see tuition free <laughs> and, and uh, uh, you know they come and, and uh, you know, they do 
one class and they say, this is not for me, right? So, so uh, you, you have to pass the two foundations courses. Then you become a matriculated student and you begin to go into your majors. Or, or we offer business, we offer health, we offer computer science. Uh, you know, it's, it's courses that are designed to, to be useful in elevating the students in the world. The master's degree program, we have an, an, an MBA program, which many of our students have found useful in terms of advancing their employment. And uh, uh, I chided uh, my friend, George Rupp, who's on our president council, the former president of Columbia, who's the head of the International Baccalaureate program. He's the chair of that board. And I said, you know, it's uh, International Baccalaureate, it's only for rich kids. You know, why don't you do it for poor kids? Uh, like in the sub-Saharan countries. And he said, well, there are no teachers. So we created with IB uh, a master's program in teaching the IB for teachers in the sub-Saharan se section. So, uh, and, and now uh, there, is, there is a limit on what we can do because it, it costs us, especially for the assessment at the end and administratively, we have a lot of technology back office and we, we, we have uh, you know, placement and things like that. $120 per student per course. So if I'm talking to a cab driver in New York uh, about this, because I'm, I'm always talking to people about this or a doorman in New York, I say, when you get to it, please pay the $120 fee. We ask the student, if you say you can't pay it, that's where John and Shai do fundraising and we've gotten support from foundations and so forth and so on. But that limits our ability to expand. Uh, we, we, we're, we're now touching uh, and I use touching because I'm counting the foundations courses. The, the students that are formally in our courses, 120,000 students. Uh, so, and we're in 200 countries. Wow. And as I say, we're doing more refugees and displaced people than the rest of American higher education combined. And we have an enormous number of success stories. So obviously we started with very small numbers and we're growing. But the only thing that's limiting us is that we, we have the volunteer uh, capacity to expand to a million students next year. So if there's anybody listening to this, uh, uh, A, who would like to volunteer, let us know, but B, who knows someone who would like to fund, uh, you could fund a college degree for a refugee for $5,000 total, you, you know, and or a person in the hills of Afghanistan. And these people have ended up at places like NYU Abu Dhabi and been valedictorians. <laughs> you know, this, we're not kidding here that this talent out there, uh, and we've started a new program, again, so if anybody wants to make connections, I'm happy to follow through on them, where we're going to corporations. Now, many corporations now, because of the labor shortage, are beginning to offer as a benefit paying for college. Our mission is to help those that don't have other opportunities. So if your company is paying for students to go to college, we don't want you to use us because we're cheaper. I mean, we're highly efficient, okay? Pay for them to go to Tel Aviv University or uh, you, you know uh, uh, NYU or whatever. Uh, that's great. But use us for the people in the supply chain. Those people in Bangladesh that are producing your product. Let's give that, so pay the hundred, and you, know, you don't have to pay the hundred twenty dollars until they finish the course. Then they come to you and say, I'm done. We're, I, is, is, you're adhering them, you're elevating them, you give, or if you've got a, a problem, like I'm talking to the mayor of New York City with homelessness, do you know how much, I, I do my morning walk, Katie has me doing 10,000 steps, you know, and I walk up to Grand Central Station and back each day and I walk the same route. And early when there was no one out because of COVID, I got to know the 24 homeless people along the way. Eight of them, not only were high school graduates, but wanted to go to college. The simple fact that I, enrolled them in the University of the People, gave them hope and dignity. So I went to the mayor, I said, pick a number. You wanna do 500 homeless people, you pick them. And they can, by the way, they can go to the libraries to do it, put some computers in the libraries. And, and, and all you have to do is when they're done with the course, pay $120. So I'm not asked, I'm asking people to help me find people to whom I can give this. And they have to be minimally gen generous. And I'll announce right here, that Tanya and her family have already decided to support one student, $5,000, one college degree. That was a cost of my doing this. So let me ask um, the, the people listening, and if you want to, you're more than welcome to ask questions as well. But let me ask John another question while people sort of uh, gather their own thoughts. You're really talking about 
um, it's a radical revolution, right? In how education is being administered and who has access to it. And I'm wondering what you want the regular universities and institutions to do differently to learn from your model beyond accepting the students from university people into their into their degrees. Like what, what can we learn from this seemingly supposedly very different model, but really the core of what education should be to do the regular institutional higher education differently? The twins, Jed's two daughters are seniors in high school. I would not want them to go to the university of the people. You would not want your children to go to the university of people. The university of people, as Shai continually says, is for those who have nothing else. To give them a chance, first of all, getting a quality education, the president's council, if you look at the president's council, I mean, it's a group of about three dozen very distinguished former university presidents, okay? Uh, and we're saying this, 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 is, this is a quality education, but it's a quality education in context. It's not, I don't see it as disruptive of the way, you know, that, that Harvard should move to this model, right? There's a whole set of lessons that places like NYU and Harvard have learned through COVID with the use of Zoom and uh, uh, all kinds of other things that should be used to elevate our classrooms. Uh, you know, so I'm using it. I teach in Abu Dhabi, as you know, and I flew over, left Friday night, got there Saturday night, taught Sunday, flew back Sunday night, right? So that was only using the weekend. All through my presidency, I taught in Abu Dhabi uh, in person. Now I've ameliorated that a bit and, and, and some of the collateral stuff especially is done by Zoom. My meetings with students are done by Zoom. So, so there's gonna be all kinds of ways we're gonna enhance. I, Tom Christensen of Harvard's Business School and I used to debate this all the time. And I, I said, you know, you're presenting an either or proposition. The University of People is not disruptive in that sense, okay? Uh, maybe there are some lessons to learn, but what, 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 where it's really important is, is showing as NYU Abu Dhabi does at the very high end. NYU Abu Dhabi is as good as any education in the world, okay? And, and, and it's interesting, both of these uh, projects display th this proposition that talent is isomorphic and we are wasting talent in the world in a way that is immoral and, 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 and is self-marginalizing. Because with this is comes back to something you say, we're marginalizing ourselves into these uh, uh, colonies of sameness. <laughs> and, and that is missing the joy. I mean, you know, the family motto in the Sexton family is play another octave of the piano. Reach out and touch notes you haven't played. If there's a food you haven't tasted, it, 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 if there's a music you haven't heard, if there's a place you can get to you haven't been, if there's a kind of person you've never met, this is the joy of creation. Why is it we all get excited about diversity in biodiversity and, and you know, we'll save the snail garter and we don't understand that the same principle applies to people. And that's what is the unifying theme here. And, and uh, what can universities do? First of all, they can, they can recognize university people's out there, use it as a search engine for talent. We will give ourselves to you. I mean, and fancy places called NYU and Yale and Edinburgh are doing this, hello. It's not an embarrassment for Tel Aviv University to do this. It, it's, it's a joy, right? So take in 10 kids from the Masimara and give them the mass of Scott. They need mass of financial aid because they need clothing. They need the place to live when they're not in school. And, and, and they need transportation so they can visit their family once or twice a year. These, these are not just give them a tuition scholarship, but support them. Give them the ladders up and we'll be your search engine. And then secondly, accept our student. We're an accredited American university. We're about to be regionally accredited. Right now we're nationally accredited, which is ironically not as distinguished as regionally, but we're, we're about six months away, a year away from getting Western States accreditation, which would be the same as Stanford's and so forth and so on. But accept our students into your graduate programs. Interview them as part of, you care about diversity? Oh, we all care about diversity. This is real diversity. Hire them, hire them. There are three 
graduates working at NYU Abu Dhabi in the administration. And it creates a sustainable future for the world, right? Sustainable not. To, to the extent that we 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 you more closely to the arc of justice and equality, we will not lead ourselves into a worldwide explosion when the six billion who have been caught in a caste system where education stratifies more powerfully than the caste system of India does, because you can't escape if you've never been in school for a day. Yeah. So um, I'm going to invite anyone who would like to, maybe we'll, uh, we'll stop the spotlighting for a moment. And if people, you're welcome in your own voice to, uh, to ask the question. It doesn't have to be through me. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, First of all, I was touched, um, very touched, that uh, even after 15 years, if I understood well that your wife passed away, you are still talking about her with so much feelings and admiration. It's really touching. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's my, I'm representing both of us. So uh, my, yeah. my, I still wear our ring and, uh, when, when it, uh, two years after her death, some of the trustees at NYU began to try to quote, fix me up. My daughter famously said, there's more chance that my father will become a Jesuit priest than, than that he'll date again. <laughs> I, I, it was very interesting to listen to you. I'm affiliated with the Open University of Israel which is a distance education institution and the model is, is quite uh, similar and uh, not exactly we are not volunteers faculty and other workers and uh, it's almost everything online but we also have instructors in, in, in all over the small country of israel and i and no no prerequisites no entrance requirements and i wonder i, I have well i I don't want to take too much time, so I don't will not tell uh, everything about the university. But I wonder, uh, how do you make sure that um, students are not cheating, which happens here? Uh, please repeat that because uh, yeah. some, uh, something uh, came on my internet. Because, how do you so, make uh, sure? Yeah, how do you make sure that students are not cheating when take when? working at home actually and how do you make sure that um that it's it's really a quality education and there is that that it is accredited in a american university so are you sure i understand everything is prepared ahead of time but do you have exams or work that are prepared ahead of time without knowing the students at all so um uh, this is a, a, an issue to which we have paid a great deal of attention, and the we includes Shai uh, and the leadership uh, in, in the administration, but most importantly, the president's council, which I share. So uh, you might imagine when you have the presidents, the former presidents of Berkeley and uh, Columbia and Oxford and McGill, uh, we're watching. We're watching this. So uh, I, I would say that... Uh, I've described the anatomy of the nine week course. And uh, at the end of each week, there is this assignment which is exchanged anonymously. And uh, uh, we see that as part of the process where a student, uh, if he or she were to cheat, which is an issue, uh, mm -hmm. is uh, my great teacher, Charlie, used to say, the sinner is his or her own condemnation. So they would be depriving themselves. Where the quality control really comes in, in addition, of course, to the curriculum that is developed, as you say, yeah. but the specific issue you raise is that ninth week individual evaluation, which there's now a capacity to do, uh, you know, the SAT exam is now administered and all of that. But that's what uh, contributes to this $120 cost, because we must do that well and in a secure way 
that presents prevents the kind of uh, 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 problem that you uh, uh, highlight. So that's really our quality control at that point. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, Rita? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I must say I'm fascinated. Uh, I still have some wonders about uh, internet accessibility. How do New York homeless people access online courses? How about our Bedouin population in the Negev who are far from uh, uh, accessing uh, uh, the internet? We have this, these troubles in the regular um, education system throughout the uh, COVID-19. So fascinated as I am, I'm still worried about the destination population, which your university, your, your in fantastic idea. How does it connect to those who really need it? Right, right. So, so, so um, let's use that last set of words that you used, who really need it. And let's accept the fact that uh, almost like a dartboard, there are concentric circles that, that uh, come out in terms of uh, uh, your ability to reach people. So there are people who are right in the small bullseye that are very easy to reach, okay? And then you move out. Now, pretty close to the bullseye, uh, are the homeless in New York, for example, one of the examples you bring up, because uh, any serious program to do it, first of all, it, we, we made this key decision, we don't, you don't need broadband. So as I walk around New York, there are all kinds of places where people have plugged in their phone and there's internet in what looks like a, a, a phone booth. And, and and they can connect their phones. And I, and I my, my homeless friend Mario has done the University of the People by one of those phone booths, right? Assuming everybody has a phone. Uh, I, well, not everybody. I'm not, listen, let's not let the perfect drive out the very good, okay? I'm not making a claim we're going to be able to reach everybody, all right? I'm just saying that the easiest to reach are those are in a metropolitan area like New York. And if the city was serious about doing it, they could set up a storefront which had computers in it or use a section of the library. That's an easy one, okay? Now, as you, as, as, as you move out, when you get into remote populations or the Bedouin populations, which I know well, I mean, let's talk about refugee camps, for example. Again, fairly easy, okay? so. I, I uh, 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 ran a foundation uh, after stepping down as president, which for five years, we were given a gift that we spent out in five years called the Catalyst Foundation. And we built all kinds of programs in the refugee camps, like the Zatari refugee camp. And it's very easy. If you go to the Rohingya refugee camp, there's, 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 a, there's a tent that's named for Lisa. That, that, and I can send you pictures of the kids there, you know? So, and you can do that with solar energy and, and satellites and, 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 and so forth. So again, don't let the perfect drive out the very good, but you can reach, and the proof is in the pudding. The fact of the matter is, we're touching almost 120,000 students in 200 countries, and many of them in remote areas. Do I claim we can touch everyone? No, but you know, we've got about, uh, you know, 50 to 100 million to, we got to touch before we get to the technological problem. And will we get everybody? No, no, we can't get everybody. But there's a lot more. With, this is not rocket science in how to get into the Masimara. Okay, I do a lot of remote travel, partly for this mission, but partly because I believe in playing additional octaves of the piano. So could we do this in Papua New Guinea, in the community where my granddaughters and I spent a week where they, they don't even know Australia exists, they have no electricity, they, they don't, there's not a sink. No, you couldn't do it there, okay? Uh, and you might not be doing good if you did it there, by the way. Telling them about Australia isn't necessarily doing them good on balance. So uh, I don't claim we can reach everybody this way, but we're low tech and we can reach a lot of people. 
Right? And I think we need to remember that sometimes access to education is not just a geography or technology issue, it's also a cultural issue. So I can imagine oh, young girls listen, in all kinds of I, places that are not allowed to leave the house, but if they stay home and study on the phone, that's an option. There, 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 there is in Slovakia, believe it or not, an inspired high school with which I've worked because of one of the students that came to NYU Abu Dhabi from it. I've spent, uh, called the C.S. Lewis High School. <laughs> And it's built on ecumenical principles. And uh, we have tried to work with the migrants, some would call gypsy populations of Eastern Slovakia. And the parents don't want to educate the kids. So it's tremendous. So yeah, the, the, so we cannot get to every point. Uh, but uh, we're dealing with a problem which I mean, the numbers are staggering of who's been left out. Remember that $400 million number, uh, 400 million person number I started with that can't get past the fourth grade. 40 million that will never see a teacher. And there are millions that have made it through all of those traps and are college ready. So we got millions to go before we get to the issue of, you know, can we get to, 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 the, to the ones where tech, and by the time we get that done, the technology would be better and we probably can reach anybody we want to reach. May I? I want, yeah, we actually only, have to finish. So, yeah, there, one, one last. Short, there is also a language barrier. The Bedouin will have a language barrier more than a technological barrier. Uh, so same point, uh, but uh, we, we're beginning to address that. So we, for a long time, were only in English, but starting two years ago, we're now in Arabic as well. And we're developing other languages even as we speak. So, uh, yeah. But but again, uh, uh, in a perfect world, we'd be uh, a tower of Babel that could be understood. I feel urged to challenge you to think of the Bedouin population uh, in terms similar to a refugee camp. And what can be done in a refugee camp, I'm sure, can be done in the Negev of Israel. And, and if the Israeli government cared about reaching that, uh, yeah. that, that, that uh, population with education, the University of the People with modest funding would undertake to develop uh, a way to, to, to reach them. It, 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 we're, 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 if they're getting nothing, they are our constituency. Uh, but uh, we would need modest funding to, of course, it's about $2 million to create a curriculum in Arabic. So we know how much it costs to you know, do it in another language. Uh, and uh, we could develop ways to reach them technologically, but we need some financial support. The, the, um, uh, the Council for Higher Education devoted money for the Bedouins. They are studying now with uh, the Open University and other universities as well. And they have the... the got over the technological issue. It's the language and English especially issue. So I think the sign of a true visionary is that um, here we are debating the small peanuts, right? The, the specifics, how can we make this work here? How can we make this work there? We're already thinking about the practicalities because we're sold on the idea. And um, I want to thank you, first of all, um, Professor John Sexton for this wonderful talk and giving of your time and your ideas to us. I'm sending call you the with link. My daughter. <laughs> and, um, I'm sending in the link uh, a New York Times article that just came out recently about the University of People for people who want to read more. And as John said, Shai uh is a local mm. Israeli who really leads this. And so uh, anyone who wants to take these ideas further and see how we can implement it locally. Um, he's uh, available to talk about this. Um, I think they're all, they, they've proven that they're very serious. Now we have to prove that we're serious about putting uh, our extra ideas into action. Um, and thank you to, to the Zion family for the gift. And, um, and thank you from Avarim for hosting us. And, uh, and I hope uh, we see you again soon. Thank, thank you, Tom. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.